Welcome to this episode of Real Chemistry. I'm Dr. Morris. Today we're going to be talking about buffers. First, I'm going to tell you what buffers are, and then we're going to calculate the pH of a buffer solution. So first, what's a buffer? A buffer is a solution that resists changes in pH. And that's actually really important. That means that you can add an acid or base, and it doesn't change the pH much. A really important example of that is our bloodstream. So down here we have a bunch of red blood cells. And it turns out if you just change the pH a little bit, those red blood cells stop working, and you die. So what do we do? We have our blood buffered. Our blood is buffered by this reaction. Over here we have a weak acid, carbonic acid, and on this side we have its conjugate base. It's called that because it's lost a proton, and now it sort of wants to regain a proton, right? So I had a molecule that was acidic, it wanted to give away a proton, and now once it's given it away, it wouldn't mind grabbing it back again, right? And so that's why we have a weak acid and its conjugate base. And those guys are in equilibrium. We know that from these forward-backwards arrows there. So in a buffer, you have a weak acid and a conjugate base in equilibrium. And the reason that's important is if I add an acid to that, well, that's like increasing my H3O plus concentration. But think about Le Chatelier's principle here, right? If I increase this guy, it's going to cause my equilibrium to shift to the left. And that means that I'll drop my concentration of acid compared to what it would have been, right? So when I add a bunch of acid molecules, a bunch of acid ions, to a buffer, it doesn't increase by as much as I would think it would. On the other hand, if I add base, that's going to pull away H3O+. Remember, if I add, like, sodium hydroxide, the hydroxide reacts with H3O+, and makes another water. And what that means is the equilibrium, right, is going to shift to the right this way. So I would have dropped H3O plus by a lot, but it's dropped by less than you'd expect because of Le Chatelier's principle, shifting to the right and reforming some of those hydronium ions. So a buffer resists the change of pH by putting a weak acid and a weak base in equilibrium. And that means there's actually two ways to make a buffer. One is we can have a weak acid in its conjugate base, like we just saw. On the other hand, you could have a weak base in a conjugate acid. So this top reaction is an example of the weak acid conjugate base buffer. The bottom reaction has a base here. This guy's a weak base. And then we can look at its conjugate acid over here. And we once again have this equilibrium between an acid and a base that gives us a buffer. So two ways to make a buffer. We need a significant amount of weak acid in its conjugate base or a significant amount of weak base in its conjugate acid. Once we have both of those, we have a buffer. So if you have a buffer, how do you know what its pH will be? Well, we can calculate that. Here's an example of a buffer that's made from that guy, which is acetic acid, and sodium acetate. So which form of buffer is this? Is this starting with a weak acid or a weak base? Well, acetic acid is our weak acid. And sodium acetate down here contains our conjugate base. Because sodium up front is just going to drop off in solution, and we'll be left with acetate, C2H3O2, which is the conjugate base of acetic acid, as we'll see in just a second. So how do we predict the pH of that? Well, the very first thing we do is we write the reaction of our weak acid and base with water. So in this case, because we're dealing with an acid, I'm going to start with HC2H3O2, and I'm going to add water to it. What will happen? Well, acids give up protons. And so all that's going to happen is my acid is going to take this proton and it's going to give it. And when it does that, then my acetate ion is left behind without a proton. And I get H3O+, plus, my water plus an extra proton. That is always the way it's going to work with an acid. It gives up its hydrogen to water. On the other hand, the way it's going to work with a base is it's going to pull the hydrogen off of water. So an acid donates a hydrogen ion, and a base accepts a hydrogen ion. Okay, once we have our reaction, we're going to want to fill in our ice table. And here we have our ice table, and we have acetic acid, the hydronium ion, and acetate. We've dropped water out from it because water is liquid, which means it's not included in our equilibrium expression. So how do we decide our initial concentrations? Well, we're basically just given them. For our acetic acid, we know that our initial concentration is 0.1 molar. And for our hydronium ion, H3O+, we know that's basically zero. Turns out water, pure water by itself, has a little bit around, but we can just neglect that 
and basically say it's zero. How do we get our acetate ion solution? Well, remember that this guy completely dissociates. That means it splits apart. And when it does that, my sodium ion drops off, and it's floating around in solution, so there's 0.12 molar sodium ions in solution. There's also 0.12 molar acetate ions in solution. So remember, if you have a soluble salt that totally dissociates, the concentration of the salt you put in is the same as the concentration of the ions that are drifting around, so long as there's just one of each type of ion. So that means that I have exactly 0.12 molar acetate. And now there's no hydronium ions. This guy's zero. That means that what's going to happen is when we let this come to equilibrium, our acetic acid is going to drop, our hydronium ions are going to increase, and our acetate ions are also actually going to increase. So at equilibrium, we're going to get 0 0.1 minus x, x for our hydronium ion concentration, and 0 0.12 plus x. Why are we doing all this? Well, our whole goal is to get the pH. And if we want the pH, we need to know the concentration of our hydronium ions. So as soon as we find x, we have the concentration of hydronium ions, and we can solve for the pH. All right, so I've written the reaction, I've filled an ice table, and now I need to write my expression for K. Well, K is always equal to products over reactants. In this case, my products are H3O plus times my acetate ion all divided by my acetic acid which I just got as my only reactant. I've dropped water once again because it's a liquid and now all I'm going to do is I'm going to fill it in with my equations for my ice table. So my H3O concentration I know is going to be x at equilibrium don't know what it is it's going to be my variable x and then my acetate ion will be 0 0.12 plus x and then on the bottom, I'll have 0 0.1, my acetic acid concentration, minus x. All right, so that's what's equal to k. And notice I know k is 1.8 times 10 to the minus 5. That was given to me in the problem. Sometimes it won't be given to you in the problem, and then you can just look up ka or kb in a table in the back of your book or on Google or on your test handout, whatever. You should be given somewhere the ka or the kb. All right, so where do we go from here? Well, this is the algebra expression I have. But there's a trick here that's going to help you and save you some time. If your initial concentrations are a thousand times greater than K, then you can drop the pluses and minuses of X. I'll explain what I mean. So here's K, right? 1.8 times 10 to the minus 5. That is about 10,000 times bigger than either of my concentrations. Sorry, 10,000 times smaller. And so if I take my K and I multiply it by a thousand and it's still smaller than my concentration, I can drop my X's. What that means is, not that I can drop every single x I see, but wherever I'm adding an x or subtracting an x, I can get rid of it. The idea here is, if I'm adding a really, really small number, which x is going to be if my equilibrium constant is small, then I can just ignore it, right? If you have a million dollars in your bank and I give you 0 .002 pennies, you won't even notice. And so we can drop where we've added x. If you have a million dollars and I take away 0 .002 pennies, you're not going to notice. So I can get rid of minus x. That simplifies my algebra a lot. Then I get 1.8 times 10 to the minus 5 equals 0.12x over 0 0.1. And then when I divide 0 0.12 by 0 0.1, I get that it's equal to 1.2x. Now to solve for x, all I have to do is divide both sides by 1.2. And I'm going to get that x is equal to 1.5 times 10 to the minus 5. And the units of that are molar, because remember, we're solving for a concentration. So the dropping x there you can do whenever your k is really small. Particularly, it has to be a 1,000 times smaller than your concentrations. Let's go back to our ice table to think about what this means. Well, just like we talked about with our dropping the x thing, if I have 0.1 molar and I subtract 1.5 times 10 to the minus 5, I get basically exactly 0 0.1 molar, which is why I could drop the x. For this guy, 0 plus... 1.5 times 10 to the minus 5 just gives me 1.5 times 10 to the minus 5. And once again, 0 0.12 plus that, it's such a small number being added to 0 0.12. Go ahead, plug it in your calculator if you don't believe me, but it won't make much of a difference. So how do we get the pH? We've solved for x, and now our last step is calculate the pH. Well, we have now, notice, the concentration of our hydronium ions. That's exactly what I need to calculate the pH. So the whole reason we set up the ice table, the whole reason we solve for x, is so we could calculate pH with this equation down here. Now, notice if, for example, you did this problem and you had started with a weak base in your buffer, then you would have actually been solving for hydronium ion concentrations and you'd use pOH. 
and then you'd convert between POH and PH with that expression. So this same set of procedure works whether you start with a weak acid buffer or a weak base buffer. It's just that the last step, you're going to have a little difference here where you calculate POH instead of PH. Since we have H3O+, I can just directly calculate pH, which is equal to negative log of my hydronium ion concentration. So pH is equal to negative log of 1.5 times 10 to the minus 5. And that will give me a pH of 4.74. There we go. That's my pH. So if you have a buffer, it resists changes to pH. You can make it with a weak acid and its conjugate base, or with a weak base and its conjugate acid. If you want to know its pH, you can use an ice table. And the only thing that's different here, rather than the, the previous ice tables you might have done, is that you have to include the concentration of your conjugate acid or base, which will be given to you in your problem. I hope that was helpful for you. If you have any questions, uh, you can ask them below or subscribe to get updates. Thanks for watching.